welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by SchoolofLaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part-time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. Welcome to the podcast. Rick Roberts here. Hope you're having a great summer and uh, doing lots of gigs, having lots of fun, seeing lots of people, giving lots of laughs. Hey, I got a great episode today, and I only say that because I have a great friend, Scott Long, who's on the show. And we actually recorded an episode with him what, maybe two years ago, and then my laptop got stolen, and we were devoid of all that great information he imparted upon us on that file that was lost forever to some thief on Delta Airlines. Anyway, I got over that, got Scott back on the podcast here, and uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy this episode. I think it's always a little extra fun when the guest is somebody that I've known for 25 some odd years, and you just kind of see that we have a lot of fun catching up in general. But also, talking about comedy, we're survivors of comedy. You know, we've been at it since the early 90s, and we were just kind of talking about how among the people that we started out with, very few are still doing comedy, and uh, that's not rare, as Scott points out, uh, being a survivor in comedy and making it past, uh, just past the open mic phase is, is one thing, but doing it for a couple of decades, almost three, uh, just shows that you, you're you sticking to it, and when you have a guy on the podcast that has done that, obviously some great tips come out, and he's going to share those with us here in a little bit, so Scott Long from Indianapolis is our guest. We'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, first, Roy Gardner, he is our Patreon sponsor this week from up in Canada, eh? Thanks, Roy, for uh, sponsoring the podcast through Patreon. Patreon, folks, if you haven't got on it and checked it out, great way for you to support the podcast. And you can do it for just a handful of dollars. If you do it at $7 a month or more for the podcast, you get invited to join Club 52. And that gives you a couple of things. First thing, an email in your box every week, just like clockwork, with one specific strategy you can use to get your stand-up comedy career a little further along. We break it down into different categories. So one week it might be business, another a writing tip. Maybe the third week is about performance, marketing, all those different things. I give you specific things, how you can brand yourself. All these different tips are delivered one at a time, one week at a time, in a very manageable bite-sized email that you can accomplish so you can move forward faster. And you can do that again for as little $7 a month. Visit schooloflaughs.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N to learn more about that. Another sponsor I'd like to thank real quick here. You'll hear more in the middle of the podcast from him. But Joe Byers with the Hot Breath Podcast. If you haven't checked out the Hot Breath Podcast, you need to do that. Uh, very nice, fun, interesting, and funny guy, Joe Byers. And he gets some guests on there that sometimes I don't have on my podcast. He's based in Atlanta. I'm based in Nashville. Different folks pass through. Different folks based in those two cities. So uh, Joe's a great podcast. If you want to get eh, a little idea of what it's like, uh, check out episode 105. I'm on that episode with Joe on his podcast. So you can kind of, I can introduce you to him in that manner. But anyway, more about that podcast in the middle of this one. And lastly... Real quick, and I'll get into this more at the end, but if you've been thinking about taking the online writing class, I just had a surge in students, and I'm kind of in the mode of, of getting into that uh, even higher than I have before, so jump in on, on the top of this wave and write it for a while. You can go to schooloflast.com, check the online classes link, and if you use the coupon code SAVE20 NOW, the number 20, SAVE20 NOW, all capitals, if you don't mind, you can get 20% off any class. The class with no feedback, the class with some feedback, and the class with a lot of feedback. However you want to do it. All right, let's get into this episode with Scott Long. Well, I'm in the conversation room here in Indianapolis with Scott Long, my buddy for decades. Yeah, I I believe you are the oldest friend that i have <laughs> in the business not like i know older people but chronologically okay. <laughs> when i met you to still be in the business uh i don't think there's anybody else that yeah, it who, reaches as long it back. was early 90s or mid 90s yeah i mean yeah probably I'm crackers guessing, at the crossing yeah, 90, or whatever that was called yeah 94 95 yeah 
And uh, I mean, thanks for having me on. I mean, I think you've done, you said maybe 170 of these. And yes. Your, and your oldest friend, you finally, uh, now, now you're asking <laughs> yeah. me to be on it. Thanks. Yeah. That's Well, I'll just tell everybody because it was 175 episodes, but five got lost on a laptop that got stolen, including mine. the first time I got Scott, which is probably two years ago. Yeah, that was a, that was probably the greatest podcast ever it done. It was incredible. I mean, it's the Mona Lisa. Of, there were uh, people at the door of the hotel listening in, asking for was, your autograph after. Yeah, the, people was, were actually paying us on the way out, which you don't see that often. Not podcast. for a podcast. No. It was exceptional. So, uh, so well, if we get 1% of that for you guys today, <laughs> I'll be happy. <laughs> but you have done it as long as I have, maybe longer. I mean, my first yeah. time on stage was 90, the summer of 91 or something like I that. I think you got me by, it could be about the same. Mm -hmm. It's either 91 or 92. Yeah, I have 26 or 27 years. It's crazy. Yeah, and you've been in Indianapolis the entire time, mm -hmm. and you've seen the the framework of this town shift around a little bit. When, when I started, and, and back in the day when you started, it was Crackers at the Crossing, Keystone at the Crossing, kind of on the outer belt. Yes. Chicken Patty had Broad Ripple. Chicken Patty sounds like I just said a sandwich. I know. Chicken Patty Perrin ran the, the Broad Ripple Comedy Club and the downtown. What did they just call the downtown club? Was it, it was the Comedy Connection comedy downtown, connection. and it was the Broad Ripple Comedy Club. Crackers ended up moving into those two. Um, yeah, I mean, at w when I started, there were five comedy clubs in Indianapolis. And I have to say, for per capita, Indianapolis had the most comedy clubs in America forever because they had four for 20 years. Yeah, Dave Wilson's one Dave liners Wilson's, down in Greenwood. Yeah. And then um, now there's one. There's one. There's two that have closed just in the past eight months. And so is Joker's the only thing left? No, no, no. It's Crackers downtown. Okay. I yeah, I think they're trying to open up something else. But I saw yeah, I saw on the window in the building right across from Spaghetti. Whatever, yeah. There's a. You know, it's where Crackers used to be. Gotcha. And, yeah. So it's it's definitely we've outlived the clubs. Well, or yeah, or, you know, it was, it's a situation. I always try to explain to people, okay, I'm 52 years old and, um, I still do some clubs, maybe five a year and, um, I like it and it's nice to have total freedom, you know, in your creative, uh, presentation. But when I was 26 and went to the comedy club, I really wasn't that interested in hearing a 52 year old guy do stand up, even though my stand up, I think, still resonates. Uh, it definitely resonates when I go to a corporate event or a fundraiser because they're used to having people that don't really have many chops at all in regards to corporate events. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a weird deal. People probably ask you even more than me what's the difference between doing a corporate? and doing a, uh, you know, a comedy club and they're, they're really different. I mean, they're really different. And the one thing that I find that really helps you in both of those, and that is being able to do improvisation with the audience because, okay, let's say you're a keynote speaker. Well, they expect you just to be a keynote speaker. Okay. They're going to listen. There's going to be some yawns, but that's okay. If they bring you in to be funny at a corporate event, a lot of times, if you're just talking at them, that just doesn't work. Right. And all those years when Rick and I were out having to do one night shows and bars and things like that, that you would think, well, that has nothing to do with a corporate event. That was the best training. That was my mm -hmm. college. I have a master's. I have a doctorate right, in right. doing comedy for any audience. And it happened from doing those hard gigs. Yeah, the bowling alleys. Oh. How many bowling alleys used to throw out comedy on a Wednesday or Thursday before the weekend gig? I mean. And then those were the some of the best ones. The bowling alleys were good. Cuckoo's Lounge in Carterville, Illinois. Oh, uh, that was not one of the best <laughs> ones, actually. Uh, there was uh, one in like uh, West by, Lafayette or Purdue area that was good for a yeah. while. Yeah. I mean, and there but, was, it seems like the farther north you went, the better. 
Mm -hmm. The bowling alleys were Michigan. You know? Well, yeah, anywhere yeah. where it's cold most of the time, they're bowling. Right. Or, Sheboygan had one of the best uh, bowling yeah. alley gigs. You know, <laughs> um, it does seem Manistee. Right. And and, and look and tell. Uh, I can. Uh, it's funny. The last two years, I have performed for the uh, bowling association like award banquets. Oh, I thought in a couple different ones in the Midwest, and. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, it's kind of a full circle where I mean I started right, right. and now now I'm performing actually for the guy that's working behind the snack bar. Right. But all that does train you for like when you get into a corporate setting where, you know, they're a little tighter, they're not expecting comedy, just like some of the bars where they leave the TVs on while the comics are performing. You have to engage that audience and Oh, I'm I'm in Lexington, Kentucky and uh and uh Kentucky Two Keys Wildcats Tavern. are actually playing yeah. uh their first round game in the NCAA tournament. But let's still do comedy. Yeah. That's like when I used to come to Indianapolis <laughs> back when Reggie Miller was playing and they were oh. always going up against the Bulls or whoever. Yeah. Uh, well, many I, times that was the case. Many well, times it's the only time they would have me because they knew nobody would be in the audience that would go, ooh, that wasn't a good show. So they yeah. Think, Rick during <laughs> come the on now. Nah, it's not Just true Just like Fair Week in Louisville. Give that to Rick Roberts. Well, that, yeah. That, <laughs> clubs that, you know, it's amazing. I don't think most club owners and managers especially like sports. Mm hmm so they would always seem like it was just a total shock that, you know, oh, I'm in Pittsburgh and the Steelers are playing, uh, happened to play on Sunday night. Well, why are they playing on Sunday night while well, there's still a show? No, no, you don't have a show. Yeah. I want to just jump in real quick about like today what you're doing. Because mm -hmm. I think comics that are listening, speakers, they know, you know, when you're home, you're you technically are off the road, but the work doesn't stop. No. And there's plenty of things that you know, new comics or people listening to this that are just kind of getting into it uh, don't realize they can do to kind of get their visibility out and get their name out. So, A, you jumped on the podcast today, which is the start of your day. So thanks for adding this in the mix. But tell tell me and the listeners, like, what your typical day is like today. What's after this? Well, I don't think this is exactly a typical day. But um, one thing that I did was, okay, I, I'm kind of a known entity in Indianapolis. Like... Uh, my goal was to do a podcast where there's there's a Scott Long in every city. The person who didn't decide to move mm -hmm. full time to New York or LA, kind of, they're like the local guy. You know, every city pretty much has one. You know that they're really really good comics, mm -hmm. but they just didn't move. Maybe it's because of their family, like me, or whatever reason it is. Like there's a Mike Toomey in Chicago. Or there's a Willie Farrell in Des Moines. Right. And these people have been around longer than I have. Yeah. But they continue to do stand up. Is there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think Willie Farrell finally got busted. Oh my gosh. And it's. Yeah. <laughs> That's very loud. So I, about six years ago, came up with a concept. Let's do a celeb. Let's take people that are local media types and let's do a show once a year where I'm going to help teach them how to do stand up. And they have a fan base. They'll draw mm -hmm. some people that I can't draw. And on top of it, they'll uh, let me on their thing. So the first year, I really only had one guy, the, the biggest sports columnist in the city of Indianapolis and he's been on ESPN and he's a good friend of mine and he wanted to do it. So I'm like, okay, the first year we did it. The other two people just, they had, they were like on the C team at the time. One right. was an afternoon drive on a smaller radio station. The other one was just doing like news, but you know, the guy that would show up to a house fire right. with that. Right. He's a fire <laughs> yeah. department. He's probably on the, the truck right now. So, and it went well though. People loved it. And those brave souls did it. And after that, the word kind of spread, oh, that's fun. So the next year I had a lot easier time getting people that I knew sure. to do it. It's in year six, I've had over 30 people that are, you know, local celebrities, mm -hmm. you know, the person that does the six o'clock news or the person that has a morning radio show. And you're like, well, Scott, why are you doing that 
Um, cause I, I put a lot of time into it. Yeah. I help them write. I actually like that. But ultimately I now, when I ever have a project in Indianapolis, Oh, I have about 24 different outlets right. that I can go, Hey, would you have me on here to promote this? Oh, I'm doing this fundraiser for the special Olympics. Mm-hmm. Will you have me on your morning, uh, news? And they all almost always go. Sure. Yeah. Cause they know me. Right. You've built and some relationship. Time. I built a relationship with them. I helped them and I actually did a podcast that they kind of fed into each other too. Uh, that was all local. So I guess what I'm saying is, is if you're trying to get a Netflix special, this isn't the way to do it. But if you want to help own your own market and learn how to get a lot of opportunity to do media, which is important. Mm-hmm. That's another thing that, you know, you and I started out and we did a lot of radio and occasional TV. Right. And that was another skill that we developed. But you've got to be on for it. You got to be ready. What I like about what you're doing there though, is a, just the stand up night alone, where the celebrity is going to be involved or the writer, the sports columnist or the news person. There's no way they're not going to promote that in the oh, yeah. newspaper article, their time in front of the camera and your name's attached to it. Oh yeah. They're going to see you when they get there. Probably the next day, there's going to be a small piece or maybe a big piece if they're the winner and they'll be bragging a little bit. Well, You're, it's not a competition though. We don't set it up like a competition. It's just like a showcase. Of, yeah. And then the other thing that I do, um, I, I stated for it before each show, uh, no one is allowed to video this. Mm. Because I want them to feel some freedom. And I'm sure you've experienced this from doing radio nights at a comedy club when they used to do that a lot. Right. If you want to hear the filthiest talk ever, let a radio person when they're not on the radio, because they never can ever say anything like that. So I don't, I personally, I'm the comedian that's telling these people, Hey, tone it down. (laughs) All right. I don't want to ever be the part of ending your career. Right, right. Where, but once again, I I think I'm more of a responsible adult. If I'd have done this at 32, I'd have been like, yeah, let it, let it fly. <laughs> let's let's see what how won't that be funny to hear the uh, the female uh, news anchor, yeah. you know, th- throw some uh, choice language and well, stuff. You, well, you, you know, that's interesting. I didn't know that you didn't let him record, and that's smart. I mean, if you just look at. Um, Matt Lauer. So some yeah. of the things he did, like at a, a roast or something, some of those words got out, and then that came back to haunt him when the allegations were flying. It was like oh, yeah. more ammunition. So yeah, I would I would feel horrible. There was one person that was a sportscaster, younger female sportscaster that I think, and not, I know had an inner like Amy Schumer inside her uh-huh. that she wanted to do, and I mean I kept telling her, don't go that way, no <laughs> please don't, and her parents were even in the audience, but then she you had to see it to believe it, but she, she went full out and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm concerned. Well, the following year she was working for the WWE. Really? So, so I think <laughs> actually that maybe helped her get to there. Yeah. You never know. You never know. And that would have killed her almost everywhere else at that. So I, I guess what I would say is there used to be a, I don't know, format, but there was a way, uh, a template on how to be a stand-up comedian. Mm-hmm. And you would go to open mics, and then you would go to the club's open mics, and then you would be an MC, and then you would become a feature act or a middle act, and then you would become the headliner, hopefully. Very few people got to do it. I always would say, you know, there's, I compare comedy to the NBA, where there's like 400 people mm-hmm. that actually make a living at it. And I'm not talking funny speakers either. Right. I'm just talking comedians. comedians Full times, so yeah. Yeah. That maybe there's 400 people in all of America. Because every club, there's only 45 weeks a year that somebody can headline it. Uh, for you know, And that can include Steve-O and, and right. you know, some wrestler. And I mean, but there's 45 weeks. So it's very elite. And people get so angry. Well, uh, Dave Stroop doesn't headline... Well, well, where's his opening? I understood it. Right. And I, and I would describe it like the NBA. There's like 400 of those. There's four. And uh, me, I was Kirk Heinrich. 
right, right. who uh, may be the 274th best uh, right, right. player in the league uh, from Iowa, like me, uh, but long career. Right. So I've always looked at it that way. Let's just keep the jump shot strong. Right. Maybe, ready to uh, go. you know, keep working out, try to uh, add some new moves all the time. Now the, that template is completely gone. There's, you yeah. you got to create your own path. Right. All the, the steps for the clubs are still the same. However, getting in to that top spot, the club, there's a lot of different routes from YouTube, which. Well, there's not as many clubs. Not as many clubs. It's a different. I mean, really, there's. I, it's festivals, I guess. But then I don't see that many people go to a festival and then become a star either. I used to be when someone that was a younger comic would say, Hey, should I move to LA or New York? And I'm like, well, I don't think you're really ready. And you got to have a lot of money when you move there. Cause mm-hmm. it's very expensive to live. Um, you know, I would say move to Minneapolis or move someplace where there's a good comedy scene first and then go from there. Now I can't tell you not to go to New York or LA. Right. That, that really now the new, the new deal the last five or six years at least because the clubs are disintegrating. It's more one night shows all over the place in non-traditional settings. That's what millennials have decided they want to watch comedy and they don't want to go just like they don't want to go to Applebee's. Right. They also don't want to go to the funny bone. Yeah. The funny bone is their parents place to go comedy. That's true. Applebee's is the place where their parents went to eat Applebee's isn't sponsoring this podcast, is it? Lord only knows. Yeah. We can pray about it. Yeah. <laughs> so Applebee's, if you want to come on board, I'll take my baby back ribs anytime. Well, that's Chili's. You got to oh, get you your go. thing, man. So the I riblets lost, are at Applebee's. I definitely just lost Applebee's for sure. Yeah. Well, maybe I can still save it for myself. If Cracker Barrel comes on board. They uh, should. I don't know why they would choose anybody but you. I know. That's James Gregory's got his <laughs> podcast. Well, it's interesting. You talking about millennials going to different venues. Even... In Nashville, the comedy club's still pretty strong there, although the typical comedy club week doesn't exist anymore where you no. showed up Tuesday, worked through Sunday. No. There'll be three or four different acts headlining throughout the week, so it is a lot more one or two night. Get in, get your money, get out for the club and for the, the performer. But they'll go to like the Exit Inn or one of the rock and roll clubs. You know, First saw that with guys like Stan Hope, sure. Brian Pashane, or however you say his last name. Pashane. Yeah. Uh, some of those guys would kind of look at the alternative venue because they were alternative comics. And, right. And maybe because the club didn't see their value anyway or vice versa or didn't want to fit in the system. But, yeah, with the, all the changes of how you can get in, really get your name out. We're not even worried about being the name of the comedy club anymore because if you have the mailing list or the social media list and the, the connection through ads to your fans, you can just tell them where you're going to be, have them show up, and prove your worth that way. You take your own oh, yeah. risk. So let me ask you this along those lines. I haven't really talked about this too much. You self produced that show. Right. That you're talking about. So a comic might be hearing this go, well, maybe I should self produce something. I've been doing it for a while. The clubs, I'm not on their top 10 list. So I'm not getting there a lot. Any tips on putting together your own show? Cause you've done it. Yeah. Well, it, When you do your own show or like, let's say you even play theaters and you you know, it's not a comedy club and you don't have a, once again, it used to be at a comedy club, people would just show up. Built in clientele. Right. They were like, oh, I don't know who's there. It's fine. We'll just go. Because there was no YouTube to watch the comic. That's true. So people just showed up and expected it to be funny. And the comedians they booked also were part of that deal where the comedian had to work with almost every member of the audience. That's how they were booked. Now it's very, you know, singular in regards to they're looking to get 10% of one audience and be there for one night. Right. Right. But as a corporate comic, once again, that's where, that's why I transitioned into it because I can be funny to, I think about 90% of the audience pretty much wherever you know, a couple exceptions. And most comedians can't just do that. That's why I tell comics, I think I'm ready. I'm like, can you be funny to 80 year old people? Right. The versatility factor is huge. Right. Can you be funny to every demo? 
Can you be funny to someone in a small market and then go to a major city? Um, and most people can't. So that's why when I'm, you know, I'm sure you get it a lot. I tell people, I'm like, I'm not just trying to protect myself here, though. I really don't want people who aren't good at comedy are good at a corporate comedy to show up there because it really hurts the business Mm -hmm. because uh, a business hires you. Oh, I saved $400 by hiring this person versus that person. And then people are like, I was offended by what that person said. And then other person's like, I I liked it, but it's just a different thing. So, okay. Promoting yourself for your own show. It's like having a party and wondering if anybody's going to show up. Okay. I did it five years at crackers for first five years. I did it. I've always, you know, I've been, that's been my home club for 26 years since I started basically, but it's never easy. The, the manager, the owner of the club is a difficult person and uh, that's how that's why I'm on here right now. This I just want to sit and just lambast her for <laughs> no, no, no. That's that would be not a smart move, right? Uh, if she hears it or not, there's just no purpose in doing that. If people are listening and you feel like if you need to vent, vent, vent personally to friends. That does not mean you want to vent on a public place right because let's say one owner of a club and i i jump away i'm sorry i'll right, get I'll, to your i'll point. get you back this is important i think <laughs> though especially for younger comic any comic okay let's say you work at the lima ohio improv now there isn't a lima ohio improv, but let's just say there was okay and you hate the manager there and there's also a uh Improv in our funny bone in Wapakoneta, Ohio, yeah. maybe 30 minutes away. Right. Those two owners hate each other and you land, you just rip to shreds the one in Lima. You like the Wapakoneta and you think, oh, well th- that guy and, uh, or that woman in, uh, uh, Wapakoneta will like that. I ripped the one in Lima. No, they're going to not trust you either. Right. If they hate that person, they're going to be like, if that person loses their mind with me, they're going to publicly Rip me. Right. The comedy club owners, if they like each other or not, are all part of one little clique. And they are. That, yeah. And say, they talk. And they are in a, a, a clique that is a microscopic version of, of how comics are together. Yeah. Like how comics can pick up a conversation right. after 20 years. And we're looking out for each other. And hey, did you hear about this? Comedy club owners are even a smaller. I mean, it's gosh, less than 30, 50, somewhere in there. I mean, look. Y- 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 <laughs> Use your comedy if you want to to speak your truth on stage about the world. But when you get off stage, there's a business. And you've got to treat it like a business because if you start burning all bridges, there we know some people. I believe that was a big part of why Stanhope ended up um, going on his own. And he, he did it. Very few people can be him. Right. His act on stage or off. But I mean, I think he burnt so many bridges at clubs, he had to find venues to do it. Right. I mean, he can say, well, I just want to do it because, you know, it's more rock and roll. Well, it worked for him. If it hadn't worked, he would have had to figure out a way to get back in the clubs. What's up, School of Laughs? This is Atlanta comedian Joel Byers and host of the weekly podcast Hot Breath, your weekly guide to comedy mastery. Every Monday, you can hear well-researched interviews with comedians like Bo Burnham, Ari Spears, Miss Pat, and Rick Roberts, revealing their tips and techniques for finding comedy success on and off the stage. Subscribe to Hot Breath on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or any other podcast platform to join the Hot Breathiverse and learn the top comedy tips from comedy's top comics. I hope to see you there. All right. Promoting yourself, doing your own shows. It's very nerve-wracking. The last three celebrity shows that I did locally, they all sold out. And so this year I just felt it was a better fit. I got a good opportunity. I'm doing this Marat theater, which is, I mean, it's, it's got two theaters in it. I'm doing the smaller one, but I mean, big acts play there, you know? And I guess I would say, I think I'm going to draw every bit as well. 
but I'm completely nervous. When I do that, it's a lot nicer. It was a lot easier when I didn't have the pressure right. of just, you know, when you'd show up to a comedy club and I was never on a door deal hardly. Right. You, you were very few the space times. out. You weren't. Right. And it's like, okay, I'll do whatever you, I will go wherever you want to promote. I, I'm good at it, but that's on you mm-hmm. at that point. Corporate events, you know, the greatest part about doing a corporate event is, is they've already paid me half of it. The group's coming the deposit, no matter what. Right. I show up. I do the research. You know, that's important. I think at those, I do a good job. I give a hundred percent. That's just the way I, I, if I show up to a, a bowling alley, I'm still going to give every bit. Um, I just don't really know how to do anything else. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not Bruce Springsteen, but I mean, I try to give that kind of show. Right, right. I might be John Cafferty in the Brown Beaver band more, <laughs> yeah. you know, where I sound like Springsteen a little bit. Right. I haven't written all those that good of songs. And I'll, yeah. I forgot about that band. Right. That's hilarious. Yeah. So. And how far out is your event this time? Uh, well, it's, it's next week. Next week. So but, you're right on the edge of yeah, it. Yeah. So I've already done one radio show from up the guy that had done my thing last year, last week. Okay. Today I do a radio show, uh, afternoon. Then after that, I do a radio show Monday. I do a radio show Tuesday. Um, Wednesday, uh, I'm doing a radio show Thursday. I have two TV and a radio. So I'm doing like six radios shows and two or three TVs. I mean, let's say, uh, Brian Regan comes into town to try to sell a theater. If he gets on three, that would be shocking. Right. Right. And I've got eight different, well, six of the eight are on the radio or on TV that will, especially the radio people will mention it on their own, Mm -hmm. not to help me. You know, they they just want to talk about it because they're nervous. They're thinking about it. They're like, I'm going to be doing this comedy, you know? And I explain that just like an open mic, the more people you bring, the better you're (laughs) going to do. Right. You know, I mean, so it, it was pretty, I'm pretty proud of the model. Mm-hmm. I people, think it's a great model, yeah. but it, I mean, people listen to how much work you're putting yeah, into tons it. Tons of work. Tons of work to build it to where it is. It's actually a little easier than it used to be. Sure. You've got the template in place, right. but it, the work still is there every single time. Yeah. And so a couple of weeks out, who were, just give me an idea of the types of uh, the celebrities this time. Are you, well, I, this is this is my di- most diverse. I've got um, Drew Storen, who's pitched for three different major league baseball teams and is on the reds this year, but he's having arms, Tommy John surgery. He lives here. He was from here. And so he's doing it. So I got a major league baseball player. Um, I have a woman, there's a show called good bones, which is on HGTV yeah. and it's a big show and it's getting bigger and they're based here. And I reached out and the, the mom who's hilarious mm-hmm. and you know, She's probably going to steal the show. She's going to do it. So I got, you know, somebody like that. Mm -hmm. Then I have a morning DJ. Uh, I have a six o'clock anchor man. I have a 10 and 11 o'clock sports caster. That is the anchor for the sports. I have, uh, an uh, afternoon drive sports guy. I have, um, a couple more than it's I'm blanking on. Uh, but so that's like, a full show. It's eight people. Yeah. I figured out that you do eight, you try to get them to do five to seven and uh-huh. a lot of them do 10. Right. Right. And then a couple people I had to walk up on stage and take them. Sure. Off. Yeah. Cause especially people are used to being on a mic and I'm raising money for the special Olympics. And that's kind of, that's the big transition in my career. And that had to do with, um, why, a, I, I try to say there was like two people that kind of got me into doing what I'm my move. And you were the biggest inspiration on that. Really? Yeah. 
Oh. Well, I, I saw that, you know, you were just an okay stand-up. You yeah. Know, but no. No, I was 278. <laughs> <laughs> Third you rider. You were another uh, white point guard. Claimed uh, off of waivers. Yeah, you know, you were Tim Legler or something. Right. You probably had a better three, but <laughs> didn't drive quite as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, but Rick was a big influence because you were like the first comic that I knew, and there are other ones that had done it, but had gone from clubs and playing and headlining you know we were kind of in the same place Mm -hmm. we were the headliner that would do great with the audience the clubs would like us back but we never were going to make any more money. couldn't sell out the tickets we couldn't draw on the name we didn't we could do the job couldn't get the people there. right right you know whatever decisions we made to not move so you were the big inspiration on that and then but i kept going i think i got I, I do some corporates, but I have to do a lot of audience stuff, crowd improvisation to do an hour because I just it wasn't clean enough. And then my daughter um, uh, was diagnosed with uh, autism and I then we had twins like three years later and uh, I'm about a year into the twins and I'm still doing my show that really had nothing to do with any of that. Right. And it got huge laughs in the clubs. It was really the opposite in some ways I had gone that way. And I'm like, there's a lot of stuff here that's way more real. Um, but it doesn't fit the other. So right. you're going to have to basically redo your whole act. You're going to have to redo the whole way you do things. So I did a fringe festival and I wrote a whole one man show and um, it had a lot to do the the overriding theme was my daughter being put on the, you know, being on the autism spectrum and, and how that changed me and our family and mm-hmm. everything and being an older dad. And so that show was even in the clubs was a PG 13 type show instead of R rated. Right. And then I'm like, I think this would work well in corporates and I could even take out the 13. So I'm like, that was the next step. Well, first I wanted to do fundraisers that my biggest goal was to do fundraisers to raise money for people with disabilities. You know, I, I'm not, uh, Bruce Wayne. I can't be totally altruistic, right? but I did want to have that as part of the deal. So that was the big goal. I was going to do it in comedy clubs. I'd do it as part of the week and do an extra show. And the problem was a lot of these organizations, they're, they're people that work nine to five and they don't want to add anything extra to their workload. So I was doing all the promotion. I was doing all of it. They were doing okay, but I'm like, this isn't working. So then I started doing some corporates more and that went great. And I'm like, I'm really good at this and I can even get better. Mm. And I did. And it kind of builds on itself. And, you know, I don't think I had any shows that didn't get great reviews. So that builds on itself. And I'm like, why am I showing up to this comedy club when I'm making more in one night than I could make at the club? Right. And, um, I think I'm probably a better fit for this. There's just not a lot of people that can do this. There's a lot more people that can do the comedy club. Right. So, and you, did you find too, did you surprise yourself that you enjoyed the corporate events? Cause I do so many comics, they don't want any restrictions. Right. As soon as you start telling them what to do, they're no. Oh, look, and, I was there. Like it, it took me almost twenty years right. to be good enough to, you know, to be able to build that show. And I think it really took life to get me there. Yeah. And then the what really made me different was is that my show was inspirational. And people were moved in more than just one emotion. Like my favorite shows are not sitcoms. But they're also generally not a show that has no comedy in it. Like, you know, the shows that blend both, mm-hmm. to me, that's the most real life. Right. And that's when I'm like, why am I not doing that? And so I felt like I was one of the first comics that was doing that in the clubs. You know, and I'm talking about stuff that people are like, what? Right. And I would do it at the bowling alley if you hired me. I didn't care. You know, I'm doing that show. And so when I brought it to the corporate event... It's like I wasn't having you walk across coals, right, right? You know, right. the but the the element of mine was real, and like, look, 
people that have been to that work in the corporate world and have seen speakers and they're motivational speakers or whatever they are and you're like Ugh, i don't even feel like this guy believes that right, right it's just like going to church and and seeing a pastor or a minister who really believes what they say and then the ones that you're like this seems like a paycheck i know the ones that are like uh be yourself be, be who you are and they've got right. plastic surgery right and you're like wait a second dude Something's not right. Yeah, no, no. But there's speakers totally. like that for sure who are like, yeah, totally. They don't feel like they live. Right. Well, it's what like they're the preaching. Time I had to follow a time management speaker who went an hour over. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a joke. That is true. <laughs> did you did you mention that? As soon as I got up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, that, and everyone thanked you for it yeah. too. Yeah. So, <laughs> my story's real. You know, and almost all I my comedy used to all be more David Tellish. You know, I still think is as funny of a sure. comic as and one of the all time greatest joke writers. And that was where the style of comedy I kind of went more towards. And now that I did this 180 and you know, uh, then I'm doing something very different and going and saying everything is true and it's stories and it's my life. And, um, mixing that with some improvisation and it all worked. So, it, it's kind of interesting how you transition. Uh, s some of my favorite entertainers are the the David Bowies and the Madonnas and the people who uh, reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I've reinvented myself probably at least five times in my career. I can think of two or three at least. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, in some ways, you not only have reinvented yourself, you've kept some of it. You just keep adding different hats that people could hire. Hey, if you want me to be this, you know, if you want me to be comedian speaker, I'll be that. If you want me to give a keynote speech and team build, I can be that. If you want me to be Barney Fife, I can be that. If right. you want me to do a motivational speech, I can do that. You, what you've done is instead of switching all together, you've just put another thing in your file it's like yeah it's like a bigger toolkit it is but all those yeah it's interesting that all those skill sets all came from comedy they did and so i've had to find the hardest thing didn't take too long but i had to define like what i am at every time right and so i position myself as a comedian who's an expert in communication and connecting and all of my programs are about connecting with either your clients, your coworkers, or your employees, whatever it might be. Comedy is one of the avenues to do that in the situation. It's also one way to, to deliver that message. And that's who you are, though, too. Yeah. I'm Once again, of, you're not. I'm like a teacher comic kind of guy. You've who, always been that way, though. I mean, it's not like, I mean, like, I have never heard one person in comedy, and I we ran in the same circles forever, um, we didn't hardly work together because we started at the same time. Almost we were, always the same position. Yeah, we were going at about the same space. But if they liked your act or not, because your act was cleaner and, and a lot of comedians, you know, they want they wanted Doug Stanhope and right. they didn't want what you were selling. They were they never said anything, but Rick's awesome guy. That's cool. No, but and then that's yeah. important to you. Well, yeah, I, just, I mean, I, like you, you mentioned earlier, you want to do things with excellence. You're not going to just go in there and, yeah. and halfway do it. Right. With comedy, with speaking, all those other things. I want to, if I can't believe in what I'm doing, then I'm not, it's not ready to present to them yet. But, well, that's the part about what's the big deal now. Everyone needs to be authentic. That did, when we started, that was not the case. No, in fact, there was, there's no way to double check if somebody was authentic because you only saw them at the club. You didn't right. see what they posted online. No. They didn't. When you get up on that stage, that personality that you have, it's way harder to try to be somebody else you're not. Right. Okay. So that whole thing about being authentic, never more the case than in comedy. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, well, just be yourself. No, you need to be more than yourself. You need to be, you need to be the big version of right. yourself. The best possible, right. interesting version of you. It's a first date. Right. Okay. Yeah. You got to put it all out there. Yeah. Well, that's, that's true. And, um, Part of what I do in my comedy class, I do ask them what comics they like, just so I can kind of stay in, in tune, to be honest. Right. An 18 year old person taking my class, their 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 favorites usually aren't mine. Sure. And I don't want to just use examples in my class of just my favorite comedian, so I'll look into it. Right. Really. 
But also I would do an exercise where I haven't done this in a while, but I would first day of class, I just have each person come up, stand in front of everybody else, and we all jot down what we think they do for a living, if we think they're married, have kids. Oh, I love that. Uh, what their interests are, and they put that on an index card. We collect them, and we give them that person. And out of 10 or 15 people, I'll ask for two or three volunteers to come up and go, okay, you might want to know and share right now what they thought about this person. And we would share that person's stuff. And sometimes it was dead on. Like, right. that's exact, that is where I work, you know, or whatever. A couple of times that would happen. And then sometimes you just see the, the person's face and they're just, they're either enlightened or they're depressed by the fact that they're Probably not both. who they think they are. You know, they're like, I thought I was more of a, Oh man, you think I'm a cuddly bear type? You know, I thought right. I was. A, so it's, but you need to know that as a stand up to much either so. play off of it and be the opposite completely and maybe play that juxtaposition. I am the big, tough looking dude, but I'm this way, or play right into it if that's the case. It's so beyond just walking up there. And you could have great jokes and still not be able to sell them to the audience. Right. So, you know, so I've done this, let's say 27 years and, um, I wrote for the NFL on Fox and ESPN for 13. I figured out a way to do that and still be based in Indianapolis. And, uh, you might, and I, I've got a comedy special coming out that's going to be on dry bar, which is kind of blowing up all Mm -hmm. over online. Like I don't see clips from Netflix and I don't see clips from Comedy Central or HBO, but every day I got seven clips in my feed from this dry bar comedy. Right. So I'm really happy to kind of be on that, um, you know, kind of the beginning of that because it's kind of blowing up for some people. Mm-hmm. At this point in my career, a lot of younger comics would be like, well, do you like where you're at now? Is this where where you thought you'd be? And I'm like, I really don't know where I thought I would be. I really just wanted to be a stand up comedian mm-hmm. and do some writing if I could. Uh, I actually do like where I'm at and probably my favorite part. And I know this sounds self-serving, but it's not eight years ago when I wrote the one man show and the goal was to do fundraisers and all this and it didn't work out and it was frustrating. Um, now I'm doing more fundraisers than I ever have. Now, I'm not doing them always for people with disabilities, but I'll probably do five of them this year. And I do two of them on my own on top of that, that are my own and the money, you know, a good part of the money goes to different best buddies or special Olympics. It's, it's, and my daughter's part of it, right? Just like best buddies, which is an adjunct organization that came out of special Olympics. So it feels great. No, to be helping people. And, uh, I bring my daughter who's now 15. I brought her on many different TV shows with me and, uh, you know, she's totally unpredictable. I never know what she's going to do, but she's a beautiful girl. She has beautiful energy and people really connect mm-hmm. to that. And I've used, um, a website, you know, cause we do these videos called happy Monday with Maddie and she, um, she's plotting them out Saturday or Sunday. They're very important to her. That's even great. If, when the video takes, sometimes she's not even, doesn't seem focused, but she wants to do these. Yeah. And uh, not only has it been a good connective thing for us, and it's helped push her to be a little more um, verbal, but um, it created a whole different part if you want to say brand, I, I, I dynamic. Yeah. yeah. And I, 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 I feel kind of crass a little bit by saying that's part of a brand, but it is, and I'm proud of it. And we've done some really great stuff and we've had, you know, a couple videos that had over a hundred thousand people hit on them. Now I don't know. I doubt they've hardly gotten me any work. Maybe twice a year they got me work, but it's another creative, fulfilling experience. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. If, you know, somebody was listening to this that I could leave them with, it would be, um, that's the great thing about trying to do this. Um, do a blog, you know, um, try doing a podcast or whatever you want to do. 
do something creative, put on your own show, try to do a fringe festival or do something, you know, if, uh, you know, go speak at your church, you know, whatever way you can, um, don't think that you have to make a living doing it though. Okay. Right. Cause if you're trying to do the, that's the, that's about as thin of a, you know, the opportunities of that are, you know, astronomical. They really are. You and I sitting here, we hardly know anybody that we started with that are around anymore. Not a ton. And I can, I know there was like 50 when I first started. I think there's three in my little group in Columbus. There's probably three that are still doing it. Right. Three or four. And and three or four is high. Yeah. And that didn't hurt that you started in Columbus where there was a guy that could push you out to different other funny bones Mm -hmm. and improvs. Um, so no, don't look at it that way, but look at it as filling that creative desire and if if you really want to make a living at it, know that it's probably an 80-hour-a-week job. It's not 40. You think, oh, well, uh, I'm just going to uh, sleep in until noon and watch Law & Order reruns and then show up to the club. That template was around about 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, not anymore. That's not anymore. And I see a lot of people that are complaining about it that ha- were part of that. And I'm like, look, I didn't get to stay there either. I got, I had to move. I had to figure out a way to still make it work. And I mean, I'm happier with my job now than I've ever been because I'm treated well, but, uh, I'm constantly trying to find the next thing for my, uh, what did you call it when you were talking about programs? Well, no, you got like four or five skill sets. Yeah. 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 And I think too, if you, if you are on the front end of comedy and you're looking at it, maybe you want to do it full time, but you don't know, you know, having the, the comedy show plus a purpose. Yeah. You know, once I shifted that and you know, when you, when we were both in the clubs in the nineties, it was all about filling up the calendar yep. and filling up tank of gas and driving to those gigs. Sure. But was it fulfilling at all? Eh, it was, it was exciting. It, it was, was rock exciting. and roll. But it, you know, as you get older, your things shift, your kids uh, shift your viewpoint on things and just life in general. And now it's like, if there's not a purpose behind the show, I have a hard time getting fired up for it. Yeah. You know, and it, the purpose can be different things in, in the different shows, but when there's an extra thing attached to it, I get way more focused on it, way more fired up about it. Yeah. And I know that after I leave, it has a bigger impact than just the one hour I was there. Yeah. If, if that's what I can do, then that's sounds like what you're doing as well. Yeah. Don't be afraid of the business part. You, you, that was a big influence. You were on me. It was regards to, you treated this like a business and that's been every bit as important as your actual skills. They went together. Right. And you, you know, people probably think, Oh, you have what you have an agent that hooks you up with. all." Mm, no, right. no, no, that's, that's very small. And they get a lot of it. If you go that direction, you're never going to, so put the time in. you're selling yourself. If you can't sell yourself, um, probably another business you should look into. Yeah. You got to get behind it hundred percent all the time. I know you've got some, I'm, I'm not, I'm that busy that I can't even, I'd love to I sit know. and talk to Rick. No, I was fired forever. up. That you... <laughs> um, I'm sure you put stuff up, but if anybody ever has any questions, I'm good about answering them too. My website's scottcomedy.com and, uh, my email and all that stuff. And, uh, mention the one with your daughter again. My, my website with my daughter is called it's an autism thing.com. It's an odd, no, no apostrophes or anything. It's just, it's an autism thing.com. And, uh, and you know, if you're listening and you want to try to follow me on Facebook or something like that, go ahead. And the, a lot of videos I post up there too. Cool, man. Well, I'm glad I got a chance to catch up with you oh, today. Love Thank Rick. you, sir. Bye. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Scott Long, good buddy of mine. Check him out online. All of his uh, contact points will be in the show notes, so you can just click on a schooloflast.com, check out this episode, and then click through to see more about Scott, the shows he's putting on, the fundraisers he's part of, and uh, it's an autism thing, the thing he does with his daughter. Very cool stuff. You want to check that out. Thanks again to our sponsors this episode, Roy Gardner. As our Patreon supporter, you can learn more about Patreon, schooloflaughs.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and Hot Breath, <sighs> Hot Breath, as Joe will say it, uh, that podcast you can find anywhere that you find my podcast, his is going to be right there too. 
uh, check out my episode of his show, 105, if you want to know more about how we connected in the first place. All right, real quickly, if you're still listening and uh, you want to know more about the online writing class, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that. I feel sometimes I skip past all that, uh, just trying to keep the episodes nice and short. But I'm going to spend a few minutes here, so if you're done with the episode, you don't care about the classes, you can tap out now. But if you're wondering what this online course contains, I'm going to kind of walk through it a little slowly, a little bit descriptively. So if you're on the fence, but you haven't Googled it or checked it out, you'll know a little bit more about it. Fair enough. Uh, So if you are tapping out now, stay safe, stay funny. If you're going to listen for a little bit longer, here's what I can tell you about the online writing class. When I put it together, the reason I put it together, I was teaching these comedy classes in Nashville, and almost every time I ran a writing class, somebody would come in, not just from slightly out of town. I had people driving in from Atlanta, down from Toledo. I had a guy flying in from Texas, uh, people driving up from New Orleans, Uh, Somebody came from Orlando three Mondays in a row, drove up, drove back. And I thought, my goodness, people, there's got to be an easier way. So I started thinking about putting all the elements and some additional elements from what I teach in the live class into an online class. So you can take it anywhere, anytime. And this has been a lot of fun. I'm looking now, we've had over 395 people go through the online course. It's, uh, It's very thorough. And also what I like about it, and the feedback has been positive about, is there's three different ways you can take the class. One is kind of get in, get out, and get on with your life. That's a 90-day silver edition where you have all the course elements right there at your fingertips. You can get in, do the work. There is no feedback from me in that quick version, um, but it is the cheapest version as well. It's just $97.77. You have 90 days to go through the course. You have a workbook you can download so that even if the course expires in that 90 days before you get through everything, you still have the printed materials. Over a 114-page notebook, workbook, gives you assignments, walks you through the steps of writing jokes, and then also you know, gives you insight into how other people have approached that same technique and how you can get the most out of it. So that is, you know, 114 page workbook, 90 day access, 9777. And I'm going to go ahead and walk through the different uh, parts, the different chapters, if you will, of this workbook, just so you kind of know what it takes to get through the course. Uh, We start off early with joke structure. I tell you, this is what a joke is looks like. So make sure you have this kind of structure or at least something that resembles it so that the audience can tell that you're telling a joke. We talk about all the different techniques that I use in my stand-up. There's uh, 17 different techniques that I use to make people laugh. You might have a great idea. You might say something funny. People might laugh. But if you don't know what triggered the laugh, you can't recreate that. And you don't know why, if you don't get a laugh, what was missing. So I walk you through the techniques. I give you some instructions on how you can do quick exercises to work that muscle and get those techniques to become second nature. So when you do create a joke, you're automatically going through that list, seeing how you can punch up the joke. Uh, One big thing that I do in this class is show you how to take an idea, expand on it to the point where you could write five, six pages, uh, but not necessarily have to, expand on that joke and then go back The next day, not at the same time, the next day, and pull out specific parts of that expansion to condense and turn into setups for your jokes. A lot of pressure is put on new comics to sit down and write a joke. There's a process. If you don't have a process already, this class will walk you through it. Uh, We brainstorm. We get every idea down on paper. We do that through a few different ways of thinking. And then we go back, and I like to say the next day, you could do it right after, but give your brain a chance to you know, relax, rest up, then look at it with a fresh set of eyes, fresh set of ears, and pick out what is important in that story. And then use those important items, that data, the specific information, as setups for punchlines. So that's a, a very uh, important and integral part of the joke writing process. If you're going to sit there and just try to write setup, punch, and get out of there, A lot of times that forces writer's block and you're done. So we're not going to do that. We're going to expand and then condense and then even further look at what we have as a joke and edit like a ninja. This is where we take everything we've written and boil down into the essence and then still remove 
unnecessary parts. I show you how to do that through examples, through other uh, jokes that I've written, and you can do that with your own. So very cool. At that point in the course, we stop, we regroup, we do a joke structure quiz where I make sure you understand what we just talked about. The quiz is self-paced. It's a it's short quiz, but it, it'll highlight where you may have missed something. So you can go back before you go any further and learn from that mistake and fix it. All right. We do a recap and review after each section, and then we get into our next section, which is all about creating material. I give you a lot of different ways that comedians do that through not only techniques, but different approaches. Uh, in that process, we'll also watch some videos of some famous comedians to show you exactly what techniques they're using. And then we go back into talking about uh, other ways you can create material. So there's seven, eight different assignments, nine, I'm looking at nine different assignments in that part. And all of it is stuff you can do. It's easy enough that a beginning comic can enter in at that point and write some material. But it's also specific enough that if you've been doing comedy for a while, but you just haven't generated enough different material or enough funny material, this course and this class, and especially that section, will help you get on the right page. Uh, we dig into some more techniques. After that, we watch a comic on Letterman and break down exactly what they did, how they did it, and why they did it. Then we get into, again, more techniques. And like I said, there's 17 all together. And then we start talking about how do you break down your set, you categorize your material, and you create your set list for your first show or your next show if you've been doing it for a while. There's very specific things you should know when you put together a set so that your jokes get the maximum laughter. I can have, and I do, I, let's just say I have 20 jokes written down on a sheet of paper and I'm trying to put together a set list for seven minutes. Uh, by going through this process that I'll teach you, I'll know exactly how many minutes I have in each joke, for one, how many laughs each joke gets, and I'll know how many laughs per minute that entire bit gets so that I can make the most out of my set that I'm putting together. Also, where you place the joke is so important. I've got jokes that work great, but if I put them first or second or third in my show, they don't work at all. And knowing why that happens and why that's important and how you can identify the jokes in your set that are similar to that is really, really helpful. I've seen comics time and time again lead with the wrong joke and their entire set is, is torched. But if they move those jokes around and get the audience to know them a little bit before they move into some certain topic areas, much more success happens. So we talk about that. We talk about how you structure a set, how you segue in and out of material. There's more than just one way to segue. There's three or four that I'll point out that you probably haven't thought of because I didn't think of them until I was 10 or 15 years in. But they work great for me and it helps me organize my material so that the memorization process becomes much easier before I do a show. Again, we recap with a, a quiz to make sure you caught all that stuff. And we talk about a little bit more how you can time out your jokes in different ways so you know what you're doing when you get on stage. Nothing worse than getting on stage thinking you have five minutes, doing 20, and getting zero laughs. That's some bad math. Don't want that to happen. Again, that's the uh, overview of the course. Sounds like a lot, hopefully, because it is. But you have 90 days to go through that. You've got the workbook to print out. And that's self-paced. So get in there, hit it on the weekends, hit it in the evenings, whenever you want to do it. So that's the basic silver stand-up comedy level one writing class. Again, that's 97.77, but I'm giving you a 20% off coupon if you type in save 20 now, and that'll save almost 20 bucks off of that class. So getting it down into the 70s, hopefully you feel your career is worth a $70 investment, but I'm not here to convince you of that. I'm here to explain what's going on in these courses. All right, so that's the silver. There's another version, which just gives you a little bit more in the area of feedback. It gives you everything I just talked about, but each of the assignments that I give you, there's 16 assignments in this course, you can email your results of that assignment to me, and I'll review it, highlight what's working, uh, underline what's not, show you how you can move some things around, show you, kind of gently guide you through the editing process and the structure process so it becomes visible in your own material, and you'll be able to take that information and write better material in the next assignment. So... That is also, uh, since we're going back and forth, we need a little bit more time perhaps, that course is available for 180 days, all right? So a little more time because you're getting some feedback from me. And then finally, if you want a lot of feedback, 
maybe you've done this for a while and you've got specific struggles and you can't figure out how to get past them. The diamond level will give you everything we've talked about previously, but you also will have an opportunity to send me some video of your set to review. And there's time for us to talk on the phone about anything you want, uh, writing or business. If you need that help, you can contact me through uh, the email and get more information on that. So three different versions of the class. we got the silver. That's $97.77. You apply that 20% off coupon, save 20 now, the number 20. And that knocks off uh, $18 or more. The gold level, that's the level with the first feedback, is $237. But if you use that coupon, you're knocking over $45 or so off of that class. And then the diamond edition is where you get the feedback, the phone call, and the video review. And that's $377.77. You enter that coupon code SAVE20 now. And again, you're knocking about $65 or something off of that class. So hopefully the coupon will help you if you've been on the fence money-wise. Maybe it's been a little tight, but you still want to get your comedy going to where you can earn more money. Uh, the coupon code to help you out. Save two zero now. All this information you can find out at schooloflaughs.com and check the online course section of the website. Click that page. It'll give you some links to click through to get signed up. So, all right. Thanks for sticking around. Listen to that. Uh, I do have other classes I'm trying to get online as soon as I can. Been pretty busy with traveling, but the business of comedy class is also on the horizon. It's a possibility before the end of the year if you've taken this class already and just enjoyed that walkthrough after you've already been through. Holler at me if you have any questions, schooloflaughs at gmail.com. Other than that, stay safe out there, folks, and stay funny. Thanks for listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Laughs podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit schooloflaps.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay funny.